Hello and welcome. Today we talk about the Roaring Twenties in Myth and Reality, the decade of the 1920s. We'll get back to in a minute what Roaring means, if you don't already know. Uh, so, I want to start by saying that this decade poses some extra challenges for us to understand, and we are trying to understand it in this class, in the same way that we'll see uh, is true of the 1950s, maybe to some degree the 1960s as well. And part of it is in the title of the lecture, the unit Myth. The 20s, the 50s, and the 60s are two eras uh, in our history, uh, somewhat like the West, which we already talked about as well, that are so steeped in myth and kind of romance in popular culture and movies and television that it makes it harder for historians or students uh, to or historians or teachers to get across to students the reality of, of these eras because you know, TV, movie images, advertising images, anything coming from popular culture sort of is powerful because it's sort of right in our face in front of us on the TV screen, you know, computer screen, and on your phone, uh, whatever it may be. So we're trying to here peel away some of the romanticized version, some of the mythologized elements of the 1920s, uh, and get down to the more nitty-gritty reality. And you do see here on the screen, of course I did this deliberately, uh, to give us a, a, at least some sense from the get-go, we'll see more as we go on, of this discrepancy between the myth, the mythological 20s, and the real 20s. Uh, the, on the right, uh, a famous cover of Life magazine from 1925, and what you see, of course, uh, is uh, 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 the roaring part of the 20s. A flapper on the left, uh, a, a well-dressed gentleman on, on the right, and the, the term roaring really comes from a phrase that was used decades ago, uh, a rip-roaring good time. If you're having a rip-roaring good time, it means you're, you're partying it up. Uh, and so the fact that the 20s is often referred to as the Roaring 20s, even by historians, tells us that it has this image of everybody uh, ha being happy, everyone partying, everyone being prosperous, and society and uh, life is just great. And that was certainly more true for some uh, than for others. Uh, and there's a, a reality uh, to the flapper uh, as a, a personality, uh, as a group uh, of women. We'll get to that as well. But on the left, uh, of course, you see at least a small part of the more uh, uh, hardcore reality of the 1920s. And that is it wasn't all fun and games. It wasn't all prosperity and good times, uh, though that may have been part of it. Uh, so, uh, was this an era uh, that uh, had to do with the flapper, uh, good times, prosperity, or as one uh, big name historian, now deceased, once said, uh, the mark of failure is heavy upon these years. And he was talking specifically about the 1920s, saying they were a failure of a decade. So, uh, the uh, viewpoints of historians uh, vary quite a bit on this subject what to think of this decade. Uh, so we're going to kind of look at that ourselves. Was this decade mainly about good times and prosperity, or is it something far less than that, or somewhere in between? Getting back to the flapper before I move on, the, the, the flapper was a type of you know, dress uh, and a lifestyle, uh, so to speak, of the time. And to show us that uh, some of the more romantic uh, and mythologized uh, images of the 1920s remain with us. You, you'll probably nod your head when I when I say this, but uh, I don't think I've ever been to a Halloween party or any kind of dress dress up party where there wasn't at least one person dressed as a flapper. It's a very popular costume. I mean, they're they're actually cool. Uh, it was a kind of a cool style of dress, so understand understandable why people would go to Halloween just like. But it does show us something about how the twenties kind of have endured in our minds and our consciousness, uh, uh, at least the, the the more glamorous part of the twenties. Uh, but uh, the flap the flapper, uh, you know, to the extent that they were real people, uh, and it was usually young unmarried women, and uh, they. Could be, they can be seen, and sometimes are as uh, by engaging in the activity 
nightlife, going out and partying and dancing, drinking, smoking, all for the first time without male chaperones. You could see them as uh, doing something trivial by just basically saying they're just partiers. And many of their mothers may have been, uh, you know, uh, political activists in the women's movement before and had campaigned and marched and protested in favor of women's suffrage and probably thought, well, what is my daughter doing? I was politically active at her age and already sort of being a responsible citizen, and my daughter's going out and partying and drinking and smoking. Well, that, that's one way to look at it. But uh, as our textbook uh, tells us, that the, these uh, young women were also breaking down some of the, the traditional standards, some of the uh, stereotypes uh, and double standards, uh, I think most of all, uh, about uh, uh, men and women, what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. So it had always been okay within the value system, within the culture, for men to go out unchaperoned <laughs> uh, without their wives, just the just the guys. But it had never been okay for a woman by herself, certainly, but even a group of women to go out by themselves. And so they're challenging these stereotypes and double standards by going out uh, and engaging uh, in nightlife and doing the same things that that, that men do in, in in that regard. So from that perspective, you could see that the, the flappers were doing something of social importance by breaking down traditions that had largely uh, held women back from complete freedom uh, and sort of, you know, complete uh, acceptance of doing whatever they wanted to do with their lives. Not that most or all flap or any flappers were, do were doing it primarily or doing it at all to make that political point, uh, but nonetheless, it did have that social value to it. So looking at the 20s in popular consciousness, a little more detail here. Again, it's, it's a heavily glamorized decade. Let me see a, a modern picture of a flapper costume there on the left. On the far right, we see, and you know this from plenty of movies and shows you've seen on television, that the mafia, the mob, uh, gets uh, romanticized and glamorized uh, all the time. Not that there aren't uh, realistic and you know bloody, uh, depressing sometimes uh, you know looks at the mob and film and television, but even those sometimes have an element uh, of romanticization that does get us away from the fact that these guys were often murderers uh, and just brutally cruel psychopaths and sociopaths, uh, and, and so uh, th this uh, is a good example of how there's a myth, series of myths about the 20s that can lead us away from uh, what's uh, most important to know what's true about the 1920s. In the middle, you see a graph uh, tracking uh, a rising stock market, and uh, this uh, gets talked about a great deal still, and you know, the 20s are thought of as a good time partly because the economy was growing, the stock market was going up, and uh, so people were becoming better off. Standard living was rising, which is true, but it gets, I think, blown out of proportion to some degree. So all these things, uh, these three, and I just picked three examples of popular consciousness uh, today about how we view the 20s, all of these were somewhat true. There were flappers. There was a guy called Al Capone and many other mobsters, mafia, uh, like him. And the stock market uh, was going up, at least uh, uh, precipitously, at least in the last years uh, of the 1920s, before it all came crashing down in a house of cards, uh, that it sort of was. But we'll save that uh, to our next unit, uh, until our next unit on the Great Depression. Uh, so it's this kind of uh, image uh, that we need to try to overcome to some degree or sort of peel this away uh, so that we can get at the, uh, the, the always sort of less exciting but more realistic uh, uh, you know, truth uh, about uh, uh, any time period. But the 20s uh, has a great deal of this romanticization. Uh, sort of, you know, caked onto it, so it's an extra challenge here. Like I said, that the, our unit on the West, this was true of, 20s is true of, it'll be true of the 50s and 60s to some degree uh, as well. We're going to start by looking at the politics and economy of the 1920s, and then we'll uh, go from there 
to looking at certain social groups. I've picked out three uh, and seeing how they were doing during the 1920s. Uh, the traditional way of looking at the 20s is that it was a, a, a period of prosperity and, and good times. And the economic numbers do uh, show it, as we'll see here. But one way, I think, to get a gauge on how a society, any society, is doing at a given time and place uh, is to look at the uh, what life was like for uh, its most underprivileged members. And so I've picked out three social groups uh, to focus on and to sort of ask uh, how they are faring or were faring uh, during this decade. So that'll be the second part of the uh, lecture uh, unit. Uh, the first part is politics and economy. And then we'll look at developments in American culture uh, in the 1920s, which will bring us face-to-face uh, -face with uh, 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 certain movements uh, and the literature and art uh, of the decade uh, and some other things, but the, see how those help us to get uh, uh, an accurate picture of what the 20s was, was, was really like. We start with the first president uh, of the 1920s, Warren G. Harding, uh, to, to show us, uh, put, putting this in perspective, uh, and this, uh, I think we already know by now, helps to put uh, uh, history into perspective. So, just like we saw that the progressive era was to some degree a reaction against the Gilded Age, that the progressives were trying to make up for what they saw as the negatives, the downside uh, of the Gilded Age. The same thing is sort of happening here. The uh, leaders uh, in, the, in the country, so to speak, uh, appear to have tired of progressivism, tired of progressive values, progressive policies. And so this is a profoundly conservative decade. And you can see it uh, uh, first and foremost in the presidents, three presidents in the 1920s, all of them conservative Republicans, including this guy. So no uh, progressive Republicans. They're still around. There's still some in Congress, but they're not in the White House like Theodore Roosevelt uh, had been as a progressive Republican uh, you know, at the very beginning of the century. So just the fact that you see three conservative Republican presidents back to back to back tells you something because they did get elected to office. So uh, it does appear that the uh, the voting public, the American citizenry, uh, was uh, sort of more conservative at this time. President Harding himself called it a return to normalcy. I'm not even sure that was a word before he uh, used it, but it became famous. Uh, and by normalcy, he meant... Uh, to some degree, uh, that reaction that I just mentioned uh, to the progressive era. So uh, it's like uh, he's saying that Americans are, they, they want to do something different. Uh, they were asked to sacrifice uh, and do things for others for good causes, uh, you know, throughout the progressive era and into World War One. World War One and the Progressive Era had that in common. They were both asking quite a bit of Americans, uh, uh, you know, to sacrifice uh, for the country, to sacrifice for other people. So it's as though Harding is saying, you know, for that roughly twenty-year period, at least nineteen hundred or so to nineteen eighteen, the end of the Great War, Americans were being constantly harangued, constantly kind of uh, guilted, constantly uh, uh, pushed and prodded. Uh, to give to this cause, to sign up for that cause, to support this, uh, you know, uh, movement. So that's like someone's knocking at the door every five minutes and, hey, would you donate money to this cause, the women's suffrage, or, uh, you know, a campaign against child labor, buy liberty bonds for World War I, uh, which, again, were all excellent causes. But what appears to have happened, at least in a very general uh, uh, sense, on a broad scale, is that Americans are kind of weary and worn out by so much uh, activity. And so return to normalcy uh, can be seen to mean, among other things, uh, the idea that uh, a citizen is now saying, hey, look, isn't it okay if now just for a while, after all that, I just focus on me and my family and getting a good job and hopefully getting promoted, being able to buy a home, maybe able to buy, buy a nicer home, uh, or raise my kids, send them to college, uh, you know, retire with a nice pension. Isn't it okay if I just focus on myself for a while and stop being involved in all these sort of collective 
uh, uh, social uh, uh, community causes? And I think the answer uh, was, at least you know, from the rest of the country and the dominant politicians who were conservative Republicans of the era, yes, uh, it is okay. Professor Rourke says, uh, I'm reading here, of course, from the screen, Harding's policies to boost American enterprise made him very popular. But ultimately, his small-town congeniality, from a small town in Ohio, uh, and been a, a congressman, did him in. Three of Harding's appointees would go to jail. Interior Secretary Albert Fall was convicted of accepting bribes of more than $400,000 for leasing oil reserves on public land in Teapot Dome, Wyoming. And Teapot Dome became a synonym for political corruption. So uh, the, the corruption was so bad, particularly in that instance, the Teapot Dome uh, was used... Uh, uh, and people knew what you meant years later. Say, hey, that's a that's a that's a teapot dome happening right there. What? Oh, you mean corruption? Yeah, yes. Uh, so it appears that Harding was overall honest himself, though not, I think, a gifted uh, a political leader. Uh, but he had sort of an outgoing personality that helps you, of course, in American presidential contests. But the main thing that brought his presidency. Uh, and still brings his presidency bad ratings. Historians always put him sort of near the bottom of the list of you know, presidents in terms of uh, their performance. But it's primarily because of the uh, people that he appointed to office that did uh, get into trouble. Although that's not to get the president off the hook here, because when a president has corrupt officials, uh, especially when it's more than one, it's, I think, quite fair to say some or much of the responsibility is still on the president's shoulders. You could say, and it's been said, and ask, Mr. President, don't you screen these people? You knew uh, uh, some of these uh, people. Some of them are your friends before. You didn't already know that their character was suspect. Uh, how could you not know that? Uh, you, how could you not be paying attention once they did get into their you know, position as Interior Secretary uh, and uh, the other uh, ones? Uh, how could you not have paid attention and kept tabs on these folks? So it, can, it, it makes you look incompetent. It makes you look asleep at the wheel, if not corrupt yourself. But I, I don't think the latter is true. This isn't very well known, but Harding did die in office, uh, uh, not of assassination, of natural causes, though there's always been suspicion, and there always is when big name people uh, uh, die in their prime or when they're you know at the height of their power. Uh, but uh, it appears to have been something gastrointestinal, and it happened on the West Coast in in, in San Francisco. Uh, and his uh, successor uh, and previous vice president uh, was this guy Calvin Coolidge. So we now turn to the second conservative Republican president of the decade, the Coolidge administration. Sometimes the decade uh, and its prosperity uh, even, uh, you know, sort of gets his name attached to it, the phrase Coolidge prosperity, uh, which was certainly a propaganda victory for him uh, then and ever since, uh, whether uh, he was behind it or not. And he probably wasn't, uh, given his personality. Excuse me, um, I have to take a sip. Sorry, my voice gets dry after talking for so long. This is my third lecture of the day, by the way. Uh, so I'm not trying to feel sorry for me, but I have to take a break every here, uh, every now and then. So uh, he's famous for uh, saying he didn't say it quite this simply, but the business of America is business, uh, and so the the twenties uh, is well known uh, and uh, accurately known as a very pro business decade very business-friendly decade, and these presidents, particularly uh, Coolidge, being uh, business-friendly, uh, meaning they tended to support the interests of large corporations, tended to be sort of acutely attuned uh, to the ne needs uh, of uh, business interests. Uh, although, I don't think it's quite fair to assume, as we so often do, that presidents or leaders who uh, are greatly concerned about big business and its health are only concerned about sort of the rich CEOs and owners of those businesses and their buddy-buddy with them or their 
you know they're they're doing their bidding because those corporations are you know, contributing to their campaigns for re-election and so on and so forth that, there's certainly some truth to that in some cases but i think we always need to consider the possibility and in some cases the uh, reality that that uh, r whether right or wrong that any given poli political leader and i would say this is true of coolidge uh, whether right or wrong truly believed that of focusing on business and and helping to prop up and make the the big corporations successful it was good for the whole american economy which would include average citizens and you know consumers and workers so uh, he, he wasn't doing this you know being a big uh, cheerleader f uh, and supporter of big business just to help the, you know, the the businessman. I'm not saying that wasn't a concern as well, but it certainly wasn't the only one in his case. Coolidge has a bad reputation, uh, not as bad as Harding's, uh, but he's sort of seen as a dour, kind of dull, uh, boring, caretaker president, uh, and he did pursue a policy of deliberate inaction, which we'll get back to because the below quote uh, speaks to that as well. Uh, the great journalists uh, and intellectual from Baltimore, uh, Maryland, H. L. Mencken, who we'll also come back to, uh, said about uh, Coolidge, he had no ideas and he was not a nuisance, <laughs> uh, which is uh, typical of H. L. Mencken. Mencken was a literary uh, uh, journalistic force uh, in American society. Uh, Mencken became such a well-known uh, and powerful writer because uh, his uh, ideas and you know writing was so widespread that uh, he, you didn't want him to notice you. It's like going on 60 Minutes today. I don't know why anyone ever goes on 60 Minutes because they're they're there, right? They invite you on to put you on the spot and ask you really hard questions, uh, you know, sort of, and you're on their home turf. Uh, so uh, Mencken was somebody like 60 Minutes, he didn't want uh, to notice you. If he noticed you, he was probably going to write something savagely critical, uh, uh, you know, satirical, uh, you know, funny, uh, witty, uh, but sort of cutting you to the quick. Uh, and he did so with presidents, uh, like we see with Coolidge here, and, and anybody else that got in his crosshairs. So, But this is in some ways a backhanded compliment, because he's saying, you know, he had no ideas, not a nuisance. He's sort of saying... Okay, he didn't really sort of come in with sort of, you know, a, a lot of uh, ideas and, and, you know, new uh, and uh, innovative uh, you know, ways of you know, being uh, doing the presidency, but he didn't sort of mess it up either. He wasn't a nuisance. So he pro he's saying he kind of was a caretaker. And you can certainly have worse leadership than a caretaker, meaning a caretaker in a political sense means doesn't sort of do anything sort of wildly, uh, uh, you know, uh, he doesn't do anything, he doesn't screw things up really badly, uh, and he doesn't do anything outstandingly, uh, uh, you know, positive for the country either. He kind of keeps a, a middle ground and holds the place of the country where it was until he passes the baton on to, to the next uh, person. I think Coolidge actually did more than that. I think he deserves... Uh, uh, he deserves for historians to take another look at him, as, as some have, but not not too many, uh, because I think he was a better president than he's sometimes seen. He d decided uh, he could have run for office again, because remember, he first became president uh, and took up the rest of President Harding's term after Harding's unfortunate death. Then he ran for re-election uh, in his own right in 1924, uh, and won. Uh, but since he only ran once, so he could have technically uh, served a second term. But he's one of the few presidents in history uh, to decide not to seek uh, a second term. And so he stepped down uh, after his, uh, you know, his own four-year period where he had been actually elected. He said it was for personal reasons. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. There, there's some other possibilities as well. Maybe we'll never entirely know. But it is sort of typical, I think, of him. I'm not saying he did it for this reason, but he may have. Coolidge uh, wasn't a uh, wasn't a seeker of the limelight. He wasn't a rock star president. And uh, I 
admire this president to some degree. I don't agree with all of his ideas, uh, but partially because of that. Uh, we tend to love the rock star presidents and assume that we need a guy that's sort of uh, exciting, dramatic all the time. Uh, I would say uh, maybe maybe that's been our problem, uh, especially in recent uh, years and decades. Uh, we too, we fall in love with the rock star type presidents. What we maybe really need is a guy who's somewhat dull and boring and but like on time, punctual, uh, diligent, hardworking, honest, you know, plays sort of between the lines and sort of isn't a, a guy that's always sort of about himself uh, and about becoming a big uh, a celebrity. Uh, and he certainly uh, uh, sort of fits into that mold. He's not the only president, uh, but uh, uh, he, he stands out at least in that way. Uh, a recent biography of Coolidge that is admittedly uh, uh, biased in his favor said that Coolidge set a standard. Most presidents place faith in action. The modern presidency is perpetual motion. Coolidge made virtue of inaction. Uh, getting back to the uh, above statement, uh, give administration a chance to catch up with legislation, he told his colleagues in the Massachusetts Senate when he was a, a state legislator. It is much more important to kill bad bills than to pass good ones. Congress always says do. Coolidge reply, replied, do not do, or at least do less. Uh, whereas other presidents made themselves omnipresent, meaning ubiquitous, everywhere at once, all over the place. Uh, Coolidge held back. Upon examination, the inaction reflects strength. In politics, uh, as in business, it is often harder, after all, not to do, to delegate, than to do. Uh, Coolidge is our great refrainer. So uh, he governed, uh, he led with restraint. Uh, he didn't just sort of plow forward, and again, he didn't ho hog the spotlight. He didn't even seek the spotlight. Uh, uh, he led uh, in kind of a, a, a more reserved, certainly dignified uh, uh, way, though he did have uh, and still does a, a lot of critics. He actually was a, he didn't like to speak publicly. He, he was somewhat uh, reserved and shy by nature. And so he didn't, he didn't make that many public speech, speeches, partly because he just didn't want to be in the limelight. Uh, but he was actually a good speaker uh, uh, when, he, when he did uh, step to the rostrum. Uh, uh, he was a good, good speaker. And he had a, a, a good sense of humor from uh, everything I've read about him as well. Kind of a dry uh, sense of humor where he wouldn't, you know, he'd say something without smiling at all, serious look on his face, dry sense of humor, as they call it, uh, but then everyone else would start cracking up laughing around him, and he might not even smile even after that, just move on, but he certainly knew he'd said something uh, intentionally funny. Andrew Mellon, uh, another political figure that helps us understand uh, the politics, conservative politics, and uh, sort of the uh, economy of the 1920s, uh, a, uh, a rising capitalist economy, sort of uh, something else I should inject here. The We know that the leaders in the 20s, the presidents and their subordinates like this guy, were conservative Republicans, and they were reacting against the progressive era. I said that before. But what I didn't say in a bit more detail was that they were trying to roll back a lot of the progressive reforms because they believed they were wrong. Uh, and uh, so, and they thought that the progressive era was too uh, anti capitalist, too collective in orientation, uh, right? too much government involvement in the economy and everything else uh, uh, in the progressive era, according to the thinking of these conservative Republicans. And nobody stands out more in that regard than the Secretary of the Treasury uh, through this entire decade, uh, who served uh, under all the presidents. Uh, um, he was apparently good at his job. He was. Uh, Mellon was actually a, an extremely wealthy industrialist, multimillionaire, uh, and then uh, gets tapped uh, in the uh, you know, beginning of the 20s uh, to be uh, Treasury Secretary. His main sort of focus, or his main kind of uh, obsession, maybe it's unfair to call it an obsession, excuse me, but it's what he's most known for, for sure, uh, is cutting taxes. And th this went 
his ideas became policy. He did he did successfully cut taxes uh, through what's called the Mellon Plan, but it wasn't just one uh, a bill. It was a number of bills that increasingly decreased uh, uh, the tax rates uh, as uh, the decade went on. So from beginning to end of the decade, he was able to, through his influence, he didn't do it single-handedly. He had to get the presidents on board, one after another, uh, Congress uh, to push these things through. But he was the main driving force behind all of this. Uh, he was he managed to cut the top income tax uh, rate from 77% uh, to 24%. Uh, and 77% does seem exorbitant uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, tax rates. Uh, uh, 24 seems uh, uh, much, much more modest. Uh, he cut taxes on low incomes from uh, uh, 4 uh, to half of a percent. Uh, and the middle class, uh, got, everybody got a tax cut. Uh, and so, understandably, uh, that was part of his wise way of getting this through recognizing that if we don't give a cut to everybody or most people, uh, then it's not going to get widespread support. Because it does uh, appear, I mean, he even said it, that the, his main concern was cutting the uh, in, uh, top income tax and eventually corporate tax uh, down, uh, reducing the federal estate tax, which is usually something only rich people uh, benefit from, as they have big estates that they uh, uh, pass down to the next generation. And if they're taxed heavily, it's a lot of cash. Uh, he did uh, promote uh, from his uh, high perch in government uh, at the Treasury Department uh, efficiency in government uh, and, and did it well. Uh, David Greenberg, uh, who's also written a, a biography of Calvin Coolidge, uh, said the core of the Mellon tax plan was what critics would soon call trickle-down economics. The idea that cutting taxes on the rich would lead them to invest their windfall and uh, uh, their windfall and spur productive advances that would benefit workers and consumers alike. Trickle down economics enjoyed popular support, uh, included discounts that benefited the middle class, uh, and by the end of Coolidge's second term, most Americans paid no federal income taxes at all. Most Americans then had no reason to protest Mellon's cuts. That same author goes on to say. However, uh, that uh, in the long term, it may have hurt the economy, uh, but you can see why it would be popular at the time. Though he does say may hurt the may have hurt the economy, and there's a lot of disagreement among professors, scholars, historians uh, to this day uh, on this question. Uh, I know at least a few. Uh, one uh, extremely well thought of uh, economist uh, who who believes. Uh, that uh, the trickle-down uh, theory actually works. Uh, trickle-down, we'll see, comes back during the Reagan administration, uh, and uh, it got ridiculed by uh, uh, many uh, uh, and other economists, but uh, there have always been some that think it, it actually works. The trickle-down idea is, is it's kind of complicated. It's in part, and this is the more simple piece of it, uh, the idea, whether it works or not, that's in question as well. But if you cut the taxes on the highest income brackets and on the rich and the corporations, they will then use their windfall, which means sort of you know incredible gain, uh, to reinvest in the economy, uh, reinvest in their businesses, as good capitalists are supposed to do, uh, and then hire more people. So it'll create jobs as the jobs in the wages trickle down. Uh, so that's the simplest part of it, whether it works or not. Again, uh, uh, open to question. Uh, but the, the more complicated part, and the part that really gets ridiculed uh, by uh, uh, many today, and did then too, is that the idea was that if you cut tax rates, uh, you'll end up spurring economic growth so much that you'll actually bring in more taxes uh, at lower rates. Uh, partly because, and this is certainly true today, when tax rates are high, capitalists find ways to sort of hide their money, sending it overseas uh, to a bank in the Cayman Islands or something where it's not taxed under U.S. law, uh, and uh, so they escape paying taxation where they might not or would not uh, if the tax rates were reasonable uh, and low. Uh, but part of it is just the idea that if you cut the taxes of corporate interests and the, the wealthy, they'll have so much money, you know, 
now that they didn't have before when tax rates are higher, that they're going to reinvest that in the economy, and that's going to spur uh, productivity and GDP growth. With and with that economic growth, a bigger a bigger economic pie as a whole, uh, you'll actually bring in more money at a lower tax rate than you would with a smaller pie uh, at a higher tax rate. This is the part that particularly uh, has uh, you know been uh, subject to ridicule over the decades. But again, there are some economists uh, that think that actually think that, that this uh, works. So uh, I think the majority do not. But I would still say it's an open question one way or the other. I guess what an open question means. Herbert Hoover, another mover and shaker uh, working for the presidents of the 1920s, becoming president himself, uh, uh, the third conservative Republican uh, near the end of the decade. Uh, it, Hoover had the bad luck to be the president in office when the stock market crash of 1929 happened. Which that part we'll save for the next unit. Uh, he was the Secretary of Commerce uh, and did serve under both uh, Harding uh, and uh, Coolidge. And as one person said at the time uh, in a somewhat uh, critical remark that he was uh, under Secretary of everything else. But again, a backhanded compliment because he's saying yeah, his official position is Secretary of Commerce, but he seems to get the president's ear uh, on everything, uh, many other issues uh, as well, and seems to you know be sort of in on all decisions in whatever department it is. Uh, so he was sometimes considered more powerful than the presidency served. Uh, he was certainly one of two of the most powerful people on the cabinet uh, underneath the presidents uh, during this period, and the other one we just met and Ad met and Andrew Mellon. So Mellon and Hoover were the two heavyweights, the two m major power brokers in the president's uh, cabinets uh, during the decade. And they didn't necessarily agree and see eye to eye. They sometimes didn't get along uh, or at least uh, fervently disagreed about uh, issues pertaining to business. Uh, Herbert Hoover himself uh, was a successful businessman, smart guy, had a uh, PhD in engineering from Stanford University here in California. And at first made his name in World War I by being really effective at raising funds and money to uh, help uh, war-torn uh, European uh, peoples and countries like Belgium. The Germans stormed through Belgium in World War I on their way to France and uh, caused havoc and destruction. And uh, Hoover uh, in that country and others uh, used the private sector, meaning going to private organizations, corporations, charities, churches, and uh, being good at getting them to, uh, you know, fork over uh, cash uh, that he then uh, used to help uh, uh, the, uh, you know, other, uh, to help, uh, uh, you know, such uh, downtrodden uh, people uh, in war-torn Europe. Uh, he became so uh, adept uh, at doing this. Uh, that uh, uh, he eventually uh, got a job, as we know, as food administrator, uh, uh, heading the food administration for Woodrow Wilson uh, for the duration of the war. So he was on his way up already then, uh, around World War, during World War One, uh, and by the 1920s year, uh, he now uh, becomes uh, one of the top leaders in the country. Uh, so the Secretary of Commerce had not been the most powerful position in the cabinet uh, before, but he sort of uh, made it that or something close to it. We'll come back to volunteerism in a minute. Uh, Nathan Miller, who in my opinion has written the the single, uh, the best single volume work in the 1920s, uh, that's why I quote it a lot in this unit, said he served not only as a Secretary of Commerce, but as a troubleshooter with a voice on foreign trade, agriculture, and labor under both Harding and Coolidge. Uh, under Hoover, uh, the Department of Commerce became a player in Washington equal to the state and treasury departments. Everything from children's health to housing, uh, housing standards to regulation of radio and commercial aviation came under Hoover's control. Bureaus were reorganized, dead wood was cut away, salaries were raised. He helped make a second mortgages, a new vehicle for home financing, uh, and countermanded the orders of uh, orders issued by Woodrow Wilson, uh, uh, a previous president, uh, and desegregated the Commerce Department. I didn't talk about this uh, uh, much when we dealt with Woodrow Wilson, uh, 
I had so many critical things to say about his presidency, as many historians do these days. Uh, I sort of left this one out. But Wilson had an atrocious record uh, on uh, uh, race and, and, and racial issues. Uh, and he, one of the first things he did on becoming president was segregated the civil service, uh, uh, segregated uh, the uh, government workers in Washington, D.C. Uh, and Hoover, uh, one of the first things he did uh, was to desegregate at least the Commerce Department, the, the one that he ran. Uh, so uh, he was an innovator in many ways, uh, had a lot of forward-thinking uh, ideas. The quote here shows that uh, he did... Uh, worry about uh, and get uh, uh, you know redress uh, of grievances of average people uh, uh, and you know uh, commercial aviation uh, standards regulation to benefit the the public and the and the consumer uh, so uh, he he was a public servant I think in the in the best sense of the word uh, meaning he was sort of did see him his job uh, as uh, to help uh, the public now did he always do that? Was he always right uh, in, uh, you know, claiming or believing that this policy or that policy helped the public? Uh, not necessarily, uh, but I do think uh, his motives were relatively pure. He was a political leader. Uh, he was ambitious. Uh, he had power. Wanted more power. So uh, that you know, all that anybody that ambitious, uh, you know, this high up, uh, you know, is not always going to be the nicest guy in the world. But I do think, uh, you know, all things being equal, uh, he, he was a a, uh, a civil servant that really lives up to the, the you know the phrase civil servant. So was the 1920s uh, an era of prosperity? Well, just from what we've seen of the leaders of the 20s, uh, it's set up to be that way. All three of the conservative Republican presidents were pro business. Coolidge himself saying the uh, business of America is business, uh, right? Treasury Secretary Mellon uh, was uh, uh, instrumental in cutting taxes, uh, which may have uh, led to a trickle-down uh, boost uh, for the economy as a whole uh, and for uh, workers uh, uh, and everybody else uh, in the country as, as a whole. Uh, Herbert Hoover uh, uh, sort of came into uh, office with lots of ideas that he got put into policy uh, to help the economy uh, and wor workers and consumers. So uh, the the government, uh, interestingly enough, this is a, this might be a contradiction or sounds like a contradiction. Uh, um, I think it's more of a paradox, but it can look contradictory because the, these political leaders, Republicans of this era, were all kind of proud of, you know, inaction. The, the government needs to sort of step back. Uh, this is a laissez-faire, right, hands-off uh, uh, mentality, uh, and was in that sense reverting to the thinking of the Gilded Age, where presidents and the governments didn't see uh, it as their role, their business, so as improper, uh, 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 ineffective for government to get involved in the economy. Let supply, demand, free competition uh, dictate uh, the capitalist economy, uh, sort of work on its own with minor intervention only when absolutely necessary and things will go better. That was the overall uh, value uh, system here and belief about uh, how to run an economy. But uh, what I just said before that does show that the the pro-business nature of the conservative Republican leaders that did lead the country during this decade uh, uh, did push in the direction of helping businesses, helping corporations. So in an odd way, uh, uh, they were uh, greatly concerned with you know, pushing uh, cor you know, uh, corporate uh, wealth and power up. I say in a weird way because some of it was by not doing certain things, uh, not by necessarily enacting legislation uh, and uh, you know uh, policies. I want to go back to Herbert Hoover. I, I didn't. I said I was going to get back to voluntarism. You see in the middle of the screen there, welfare capitalism, business associationalism. Those don't mean the same thing completely, but Hoover uh, believed in kind of a nicer, gentler capitalism. Uh, at least he believed it was possible. This is one of the areas, uh, maybe the main overall area, where he butted heads uh, with 
Andrew Mellon, also on the cabinet. Mellon was more of your old style capitalists uh, who uh, just thought, you know, it's it's a it's a war, you know, among other things between uh, you know the businesses on one side ownership, management on one side, and labor uh, and the workforce on the other side, unions on the other side. Uh, but Hoover thought that's wasteful. Uh, that's uh, we, we can do better than that. And welfare capitalism um, doesn't mean uh, exactly what it might sound like. It, it did mean that we need to find ways to bring the businesses, the management, and the workers, workforce, and their union representatives together in a more productive way. So they're not fighting each other all the time that they might have legitimate issues, but we're going to try to put this into some sort of framework where things can be worked out more amicably uh, without as much friction and without as much waste. So he was progressive in that sense, uh, not progressive in his overall political views, but uh, believe in kind of a pro progressive business uh, stance. Uh, one of the things that welfare capitalism espoused and got involved in uh, was Hoover uh, included was promoting company uh, run unions so instead of the old way of doing things like during the Gilded Age where not all but many corporations like Carnegie's uh, steel uh, company just flat out opposed union organizing uh, and would crush the unions and workers uh, if and when they could here Hoover and others of the progressive capitalist bent uh, are saying no uh, the companies should not only accept union you know uh, leadership and workers belonging to unions but the the corporation should be involved in it uh, they should help sort of put the uh, the union together and this may have had benefit and may have achieved the uh, sort of the capitalism with a happy face uh, goal uh, or goals that Hoover was sort of supporting here but you can see what critics uh, would and did say right away, and that is, oh, this is just the company trying to get involved in the union so it can control it, uh, so it can sort of water down uh, any uh, anything that uh, uh, you know might be more threatening uh, if in the hands of a union that was completely independent of the corporation. So uh, this is their way to kind of manipulate, control, uh, and moderate, you know, the. Uh, the demands, uh, the desires uh, of the workforce uh, and their union. Volunteerism uh, meant uh, a, a strong belief, and Hoover did have this belief, that much can be accomplished by government by working with and through the private sector, that not everything has to be done uh, by the government itself. Uh, it can work kind of in partnership with the private sector, sometimes farm things out to the private sector. Keep in mind, he'd been wildly successful in World War One again, at raising money uh, uh, from the private sector in Europe and uh, other places uh, uh, to help refugees uh, uh, losing their homes during the war, uh, uh, people suffering from uh, one aspect of the war or another. So uh, no wonder he had such uh, confidence and faith uh, going forward that volunteerism uh, could work in other uh, ways and other things as well. So back to the new era, as it was sometimes called, uh, new, for the most part, meant, when used this way, that this is sort of a new type of prosperity. Part of what was new about it was some of people saw, seemed to believe that this was going to be permanent, that the economy was going to be prosperous and there wouldn't be uh, sort of ups and downs as there always been uh, had been before. There wouldn't be a business cycle uh, really any longer uh, as uh, you know, it's uh, often called. Uh, Wilfred McClay, in Land of Hope, I've quoted uh, a number of times, unit after unit, uh, says the sheer size of the American economy was simply astounding. It truly was becoming the economic colossus of the world. The U.S. was producing nearly half the world's output, I mean, that means of goods uh, as a whole, and possessed wealth equivalent to all of post-war Europe wealth adding up to perhaps 40% of the world's total wealth. New construction almost doubled from 6.7 billion to 10.1 billion from in the beginning of the decade to end. Wages rose and unemployment never rose uh, above the natural rate of around 4%. Average income from start to finish the decade uh, went up by about 25%. Uh, 
Uh, and if you look at the GDP numbers, uh, roughly speaking, uh, from right on the left there, 1920 to 1929, uh, they go up every single year. Uh, Professor Rourke, our guy, says mass production of a broad range of new products, cars, radios, refrigerators, electric irons, washing machines, produced a consumer goods revolution. Uh, so standard of living uh, did uh, go up for uh, most Americans. Not all. Uh, there are some left out of this. There are big uh, pockets of uh, uh, poverty and deprivation. Uh, but overall, uh, most people were living at least slightly, uh, uh, I think, better lives from an economic perspective, uh, again, in terms of standard of living uh, uh, and, you know, the comforts uh, of uh, things like appliances and refrigerators, uh, etc., and, and wages to some degree as well. Uh, but uh, maybe the 20s have been somewhat overrated in terms of uh, how prosperous uh, the decade was, right? Getting back to the myth of prosperity and good times in the Roaring Twenties, since that's been laid on, uh, you know, with a trowel, uh, uh, you know, very uh, thick uh, layer uh, of this kind of uh, romanticization. So uh, the Twenties might be somewhat less impressive economically, uh, as uh, we're sometimes led to believe. But once again, sort of playing devil's advocate, going back and you know, taking one side and then another and then back again, there certainly was a lot to be said for American uh, business and the American economy during this time. And uh, undoubtedly, uh, sort of the icon of the age was this guy, Henry Ford, who started a company which is still kind of around today, uh, right? Uh, and was the first uh, leading figure uh, in the automotive industry. Not the last, but the first, but the first, and he became really the symbol of the new industrial age. If Rockefeller um, was kind of the symbol, or Carnegie, Rockefeller is the bad guy symbol, Carnegie the good guy of the uh, Gilded Age, uh, it was Ford uh, during this period. Uh, but uh, as we'll see, Ford did have somewhat of a sort of checkered personality and. There's plenty to say on sort of both sides, pro and con, about uh, Henry Ford. Uh, nonetheless, uh, his uh, business took off, uh, certainly uh, partly because of his own ability, uh, and uh, he organized uh, the factory system, uh, revolutionized the assembly line process of production, which we've already talked about in an earlier unit, the conveyor belts, uh, right, and you can see uh, an early one in the lower left there, uh, and the larger factory in the middle, uh, upper middle. Uh, but uh, his engineers uh, and uh, you know uh, subordinates uh, put together a system of production that was astonishingly efficient. Uh, a car uh, in 93 minutes uh, after they put these sort of initial assembly line uh, processes together, instead of the uh, earlier 12 hours. From 12 hours to 93 minutes means that Henry Ford, once he realized this was going to work that well, uh, you know, went to sleep at night with dollar signs in his eyes. Because we already know, uh, right, I hope we already know this uh, from uh, how much I uh, tried to drum at home earlier in the class, that if you save money at uh, uh, the production end, the labor end uh, in business, uh, you're going to probably outsell your opponents on the other end because you can afford to undersell them, lowball them, uh, sell your product cheaper, and then everybody comes flocking to you. That plus the fact that uh, Henry Ford's uh, cars uh, were quite simple, at least at first. Uh, this is an, a little bit later version, the Model A Ford. The first one was the Model T. Uh, but the Model T was cheap because uh, it, it was fa fairly basic. Uh, and uh, he wanted it that way so he could sell sort of mass uh, uh, cars. But uh, uh, his, uh, not only the engineering and technology, but his sort of uh, ideas about how to deal with the workforce and all aspects of his business were innovative. Uh, he paid, uh, which was revolutionary for the time, it'll sound funny now, a $5 a day. Uh, workers got $5 a day working on the assembly line which was revolutionary because that went beyond the market price. In a capitalist system, wages are supposed to be determined by what the market allows. Uh, so you, you pay your workers as little as you can without losing them to somebody else. Uh, 
you know, uh, that they'll work for instead uh, if you don't pay them enough. Uh, but Ford just said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm paying them above uh, what I you know, could get away with. The thinking being, and this is, and Ford himself is somewhat then progressive, progressive in a business sense, not sort of in the political sense. Uh, he's saying, if we, if you treat your workers better, you're going to get more productivity out of them. Uh, if you pay them more, uh, right, uh, you know, and you have to, it might sound like a waste, but it's not, because by when you do that, it keeps their morale high. They like you, they like the company, they like their job, uh, and they'll work harder and be more productive. So it'll actually put more money in the company's pocket. It'll actually increase their profits. Paying uh, more money to the workers uh, will actually bring in more profit. It's counterintuitive, somewhat like the trickle-down idea that we talked about uh, b before. Uh, so Henry Ford was innovative uh, and ahead of his time in many ways, though others would pick up on this. And there were some other... Uh, business progressives already. Mark Hanna, we've already met and we'll meet again, the guy that uh, masterminded and ran William McKinley's successful uh, bid for the presidency in 1896. Uh, uh, Hanna, uh, in a great quote, I wish Henry Ford had said this, uh, I could put it right here, but Hanna said, uh, any businessman uh, that uh, is unwilling to meet his workers halfway is a damned fool. And that's basically what he meant, uh, that uh, if you don't see that it's in your best interest uh, as the owner of a company uh, uh, to do good by your workers, even if it costs you more money, you're, a, you're an idiot, you're a fool, because you'll make more money uh, if they're happy uh, and their, uh, you know, their morale is high, uh, they'll be more productive. But there was another Henry Ford. I don't mean there were, I mean, I'm sure there were other people named Henry Ford in the country. I think that would stand to reason. The odds of that would be pretty high. Uh, but, uh, uh, and I don't mean he had a, a you know, a, a clone or a double. Uh, but he had another side to him, uh, uh, to be sure. Uh, this isn't always covered, but I believe it should be. And I'm not trying to villainize Henry Ford. As you know, it's, uh, I make an editorial comment here and there. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't see it as my job uh, to uh, uh, rip into, you know, one historical figure or another. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to sort of let you know uh, what happened uh, and uh, give you different uh, ways to look at uh, these individuals. If you want to judge Henry Ford, a good guy or a bad guy or both, uh, right, uh, that's up to you. Uh, I did the same thing uh, with the... Uh, uh, industrialists of the Gilded Age, Rockefeller, Carnegie, uh, I showed you things that could be uh, sort of put on the, you know, on the pro side of the ledger uh, that were positives uh, for American society uh, and things that they did that could be put on the negative side uh, as, uh, uh, you know, harmful things they did for American society. So I'm kind of doing both here, uh, the pro on the last side and the major uh, uh, negative, the major, uh, I think, mark against him, though there are some others as well, is that this iconic businessman had a not-so-hidden uh, uh, anti-Semitism. It's more hidden now than it was then. Uh, I don't mean it's literally hidden. But people just don't talk about it too much. Uh, but uh, uh, he was uh, an anti-Semite, uh, and a rather extreme one at that. Nathan Miller, again, says, Racism and antipathy to foreigners bordering on paranoia created a demand for even tighter restrictions on immigration than those erected in 1921. The Dearborn Independent, a weekly newspaper owned by Henry Ford, fueled the outcry with inflammatory anti-Semitic articles. 91 consecutive issues, 91 consecutive weeks, were devoted to the international Jew, the world's problem. That was the sort of the basically the title or the theme of 91 consecutive issues of this newspaper that he owned. The paper circulated the Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion, a document faked by the Tsarist secret police in Russia that outlined a supposed Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. Uh, not only were Jews unscrupulous bankers, the union-hating Ford also charged that they were behind efforts to organize the workers. Quote, Unions are organized by Jewish financiers. They are a scheme to interrupt work. A union is a neat trick for a Jew to have in hand when he wants to get a clutch on an, in an industry, unquote. Uh, and we could go on and on and on about this. So there certainly is uh, 
a, a, a much sort of less uh, appealing side uh, to Henry Ford. American business ingenuity was at a high point in the 1920s. It, it certainly would go on for some decades after this, but uh, all kinds of new ideas uh, around America was produced, you know, was the manufacturer of the world, was already getting involved in all kinds of other uh, uh, industries as well, and starting to take over uh, credit and finance, etc. Et uh, so, uh, of one of the one of the innovations we see here, which doesn't sound like an innovation to us because we're now decades into it, we're so used to it, it seems like nothing. Uh, but chain uh, department stores, chain grocery stores, supermarkets, the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, I guess somewhat misnamed, uh, eventually had seventeen thousand five hundred grocery stores across the country by nineteen twenty seven. Uh, so uh, that had been kind of unknown in previous eras, the idea of a chain. Now everything's a chain in this in this country. Uh, so we're kind of used to Starbucks everywhere and Home Depot everywhere and you know, Jack in the Box everywhere. Uh, but uh, it wasn't that way and didn't start doing that kind of thing until the 1920s. You also see uh, all kinds of uh, efforts to sell products uh, through the mail, uh, mail order catalogs in the lower right. There's the Sears Roebuck uh, one. Sears became one of the leading uh, uh, department stores in the country uh, and did have did do a lot of business from its chain, excuse me, stores as well, but a, a lot from mail order as well. This seems rather quaint to us today because we can go online uh, and do something like this uh, much easier uh, than to have to sort of send something in by mail you know, filling in the appropriate number of the product and then uh, putting a check in with it and then they, sh they ship it back to you. Uh, took much more time, uh, as you are certainly aware, uh, than Amazon uh, today. Nonetheless, it's kind of a move uh, in that direction uh, already. Henry Ford uh, quickly had competitors, uh, uh, particularly in General Motors, Alfred Sloan uh, and other uh, formative figures in General Motors. And Ford didn't believe uh, in selling uh, on installments, didn't believe in selling on credit. That's partly why he kept his cars cheap. He wanted to be able to play cash, cash in hand. He could afford it and sort of get the transaction done. And when General Motors came along, they realized that's an opening for us. And they started uh, GMAC as sort of a separate uh, but related uh, a company that did the, was the financing arm uh, and wing for General Motors itself. Uh, which became giant uh, over time. But this was innovative because Ford was the leader uh, and the, you know, sort of the, the guy who started the automotive industry sort of on its spectacular path of growth. But uh, it's uh, General Motors that first pioneered the idea of selling cars uh, based on credit and monthly payments, which again sounds silly uh, as an innovation because we're so used to it now. But this was really the first... Uh, uh, where, where this uh, type of product and others uh, uh, sort of were sold this way. You see a Woolworths department store in sort of the middle right there. Uh, uh, you see a General Electric lab in the lower left. Uh, General Electric, uh, and there you see their, uh, their motto on the top right, uh, based in Schenectady, New York. Uh, and uh, their labs uh, were extremely well known for uh, innovative technology, uh, scientists and engineers, uh, top-notch scientists and engineers paid a lot of money uh, to come up with new ideas uh, and uh, uh, you know to market them uh, if they were marketable, profitable uh, for the company. I could go on and on about business innovation in the 20s, uh, but uh, you get the idea. There was an explosion in advertising uh, in the 20s as well, which certainly is connected uh, to the growth uh, and success of the economy. Uh, as uh, Nathan Miller says again, stimulated this stimulated the desire for new products and hammered away at the traditional values of thrift and saving. Newspapers, magazines, radios, and billboards told Americans uh, what they had to have in order to be popular, secure, and successful. Actually, since I didn't put the name, I think that quote's from Professor Rourke. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but the bottom one is from Professor Miller. Wartime propaganda techniques and the use of psychological studies of the buying public brought a new and sophisticated uh, uh, sophistication to the trade. I said this when we covered World War I uh, in class. Uh, 
uh, but the techniques used to sell Americans on supporting the war or young men to sign up for the draft and go fight in the war were the same techniques now used to sell uh, Listerine, uh, vacuum cleaners, cigarettes, etc., etc. Uh, instead of uh, you know finding ways to get convince them to go kill Germans, they're getting them to find ways to go buy cigarettes and uh, uh, breath mints. Which actually go together pretty well. So uh, the techniques, uh, uh, not not only the techniques, uh, but some of the major figures from CPI. Uh, uh, the Committee on uh, Public Information from World War One, Wilson administration, uh, including a guy named Edward Bernays, uh, not surprisingly then became sort of the leading figures uh, on Madison Avenue, the heart of the advertising and public relations industry uh, in New York City. So the same people that were the, the main brains behind the propaganda of uh, World War One, for World War One, uh, largely became the same people that were the corporate executives uh, and the sort of the main uh, uh, thrust in terms of uh, ideas pertaining to a advertising of products, uh, you know, corporate products here. So, uh, but uh, the advertising techniques became increasingly, increasingly sophisticated based on psychological studies. So they're manipulating human nature, human psychology, which is somewhat frightening to behold. Though it, of course, is still goes on and uh, but uh, if you haven't read anything on this if you start reading a book or two on it uh, you'll be shocked at how much thinking how many resources how much brain power goes into finding ways to get you uh, to buy this or that product and all of us like to think that we're not affected by advertising but of course we are I mean maybe some people less than others more than others but we're affected what one of the ways I know this is that corporations for decades and decades spend billions of billions of dollars uh, a year on advertising and if there's one thing I know about corporations uh, at least ones that survive and are very profitable they tend not to throw money down the drain uh, for long periods of time uh, if something's not working uh, they might throw money down the drain uh, a lot of it in a short period of time until they realize it's not working but they're not going to do so for decades so my point is Corporations wouldn't be spending billions every single year on advertising if their studies uh, uh, weren't coming back uh, showing that it works. Uh, and of course it works. And one of the things to keep in mind is that the at the most uh, broad level, they're not so much selling you the product, is they're selling you... Uh, sort of a view of America. They're selling you a view of what a successful American is. They're selling you uh, on, you know, uh, what it means uh, uh, to be an American. They're sometimes uh, guilting you or uh, uh, sort of playing on your fears. This is the psychology part of this. So uh, it's sometimes uh, linking the product uh, uh, to fears uh, of what will happen if you don't have the product uh, and linking them to status. Uh, uh, this is where I think the psychology really comes into play. Now, uh, uh, you know, by uh, you know this day and age, the studies I think are quite clear that human beings have been uh, concerned about status for thousands of years, going back to prehistory. That uh, all peoples uh, are concerned, whether they know it or not, whether they you know uh, want to be or not, they're concerned with their status. And status, more or less, means you know how we sort of size ourselves up. Uh, against our neighbors, against our friends, against other people in the community, uh, where do we where do we fit? How do we try to show that we we belong or that we're better or superior uh, in this kind of competitive way of uh, you know sort of dealing with each other? Sometimes jostling, uh, uh, competing, sometimes cooperating. Uh, but uh, th this is, I think, the main uh, innovation in advertising around this time, uh, which is to sort of play on status concerns. Uh, so, you uh, and, and again to play on American patriotism uh, and, and the American dream, American success story. So, if you don't have, or you don't smoke Lucky Strike cigarettes, uh, maybe you're not a real American. If you don't have one of these kind of vacuum cleaners, uh, maybe you're not a very successful American. If you don't have Listerine uh, as a man, uh, right, trying to woo a woman, uh, uh, she might never go never go out with you again. So uh, uh, you better be careful. Uh, now, the the in the latter case, and I just you know constructed these here uh, for the purpose of examples. Uh, 
In the latter case, they are trying to sell you the product through fear itself, but in the other two, it's more indirect. It's more about it's more about status. Oh, please.